My boss tells a story. I hurried behind my boss as he strode off down the street. It was unusual that he should want to walk even if the dealership was close by, but I wasn't going to ask him to explain. We covered good ground despite waiting impatiently at the crossings for the traffic, dropping a large note into the bowl of one of the female beggars seated in front of the temple, and helping an old gent out of his car. At the dealers, we concluded our business and declining the offer of a car to drop us back strode out into the twilight at a more leisurely pace than before i must have been about 16 no i was 18 he started without preamble i used to visit this temple regularly inside it's cool and dim the light from the evening diyas and aartis lending a golden glow a soft peaceful vibe i haven't been back in years are you a regular temple goer i confessed i wasn't i was a pious child and visited often i felt a sense of peace and self control there I was standing against a pillar one day with my eyes closed in prayer and contemplation when I felt a current of energy I struggled to retain my focus and failing fluttered my eyes open instantly I knew what or whom had caused the disruption She was standing in front of the sanctum her eyes fixed on the idol tall and still and earnest in her hands was a brass thali with flowers coconut and a burning camphor she wore a plain yellow sari her head covered a small chandan dot on her forehead her sari caught the gentle currents of air that always moved through the temple and rippled around her face and ankles her lips moved soundlessly as she made her private plea to god she did nothing to draw attention to herself she was dressed appropriately and behaved traditionally she was silent and respectful and yet she had a magnetism and not one of us could avert our eyes i made myself leave and was slipping on my shoes when she tripped lightly down the temple stairs She didn't go to reclaim her slippers but set off barefoot down the street so I knew she must live nearby Of their own volition my feet followed her This was in the days before stalking was a thing She went into a decent middle class kind of boarding house I hung around for a while and finally took myself off home But now I knew where she lived so I frequently lurked like Freddy Einsford Hill on the street where she lived she appeared to have no life other than the temple which she visited every day so i bumped into her accidentally on purpose one day and said oops sorry but oh haven't i seen you in the temple crushingly she hadn't noticed me she was of course much older than me in her early 30s i would think but mysterious mesmeric and magical and i was properly smitten she was amused by me indulged me chatted laughed but always like a favorite aunt i knew this was the most i was going to get for the present and resigned myself to it i would accept any crumb of her attention just to be in her presence She had a problem she needed God's help with. That much was patent. I asked her if I could help. 
She laughed that tinkling little laugh that made me mad with adolescent desire and said, You've a fine opinion of yourself, young man. I've just told you even God can't help me and yet you think you can? I hadn't meant that, I stammered, just that I'd try my best and beyond to resolve her problems. As you know, I'm dogged and I've always believed that if you try enough, most opposition will crumble before you. And this, eventually, she did, admitting that her problem was financial. Very large, larger than she could resolve herself or find any way of resolving. I clicked my fingers cockily. Money! Was that all? Money problems were always resolvable. It was a matter of negotiation and creative solution finding. She should tell all and leave it with me. The fact that she found that funny was eminently deflating. It whipped up in me a fierce desire to show her that I could solve her problems. I could and I would. I yearned for her love and respect. I didn't want to be an object of amusement, a plaything. To make matters worse, I'd noticed that she was receiving visits from two other men. A mustachioed chap with jet black hair, slicked back with brill cream, whom I instinctively despised. And a chubby fellow with a sweaty brow and a pinky ring, whom I detested even more. I told her that if she wouldn't let me negotiate on her behalf, she should at least permit me to draw out the money in my bank account and put it at her disposal. She would not hear of it. My parents would never permit it, even if she accepted, she said. I remember pulling myself up to my full height, informing her that I was an adult, fully 18 and I didn't need my parents' permission to spend my own money. She patted my cheek, sending me into paroxysms of ecstasy and irritation. Thanks, my sweet, but I can't let you do that for me. It was exactly that gesture that tipped me over the edge. And by the next morning, I was in the bank petitioning to withdraw every penny from my account. The bank manager called me into his cabin and I was questioned but refused to answer as to why I needed the cash. He threatened to call my father. I counter-threatened to officially complain if he did any such thing. I was an adult and he had no right to deny me either access to my money or my privacy. Years of birthday and festival gifts of something and one, where I was permitted to keep only the one and the something, however big or small, was safely banked for when I grew up. Well, I was grown up now. And if I wanted my own money, he couldn't deny me. It caused no end of a commotion. But he had to hand over the cash ultimately, and I left the bank in high dudgeon, even though I'd won my case. I made my way straight to the boarding house and insisted on seeing her, though she twice refused me. When she finally came down, I handed over the package and now there was another scene because she wouldn't accept it. In the end, I placed it on the chair beside her as she wept into the pallu of her sari that she couldn't accept a child's birthday savings. I was deeply insulted. I had drawn out the cash, I said, and I was leaving it there in her service so she could use it or not as she saw fit. I would visit her the next day. I strode out, feeling a man. I noticed Mr. Mustachios arriving as I left and I felt a quiet satisfaction that I'd been able to support her in ways that he couldn't, despite his fertile facial decorations and my patent lack of any. I visited the temple and thanked God for giving me this opportunity to help a poor woman who had no other support in this world. 
she couldn't help but respect my generosity and my actions of total trust and belief in her. I'd asked no explanation, no revelation of her past to traumatize her with in future. I'd just handed it over for her to use as she saw fit. I was puffed with satisfaction that whole day, knowing I'd done my masculine duty to defend a frail and helpless woman. I dressed with utmost care the next day. She would see me with new eyes. I wanted to look my best. I walked on air, my feet hardly touching the ground. As I turned in at the gate, the slouching watchman roused himself from his customary topo to waggle his thumb at me. I looked at him superciliously. What could such an insolent gesture mean? The bird has flown, he said, with a distinctly evil grin. I controlled an urge to punch his silly smirking face and continued inside, where I was officially informed that the lady no longer resided there. What? Where? When? I asked. After I left the previous day, Mr. Mustachios and the odious chap with the pinky ring had visited in quick succession. And soon after their departure, she'd settled her bill and left on foot with a small bag of her possessions. No one knew where to. She'd brought us perfectly and with great skill to boiling point, all three of us. And she'd cleaned up and decamped. We stood awkwardly on the pavement. He'd been made a right fool of, young as he'd been. He knew it himself. Since that day, I haven't seen her. So you can imagine my shock when I recognized her sitting in front of the temple a few days ago. It is undoubtedly her. Much further reduced than when I first met her. And now, time has robbed her of the primary tools of her trade. Her magnetic beauty. I gaped at him in slack-jawed horror. My eyes ricocheted between him and the temple pavement, barely visible in the fading daylight, seeking the woman amongst the row of beggars seated patiently in hope of the generosity of worshippers. I couldn't connect the tantalizing woman he'd described with the beggar we'd passed by with so little concern on our way out. Beauty fades, he said meditatively. <laughs>